Hi, Ryan. Hi, Rachel. How are you? Oh, oh, Rachel, I am excited almost beyond words, which is、uh, an awful thing to be when you are someone who has to podcast and that、Some、requires all the words. Oh、platform. my! Oh, oh, it's like that Will Smith movie, not Will Smith, Eddie Murphy movie, where he is going to run out of words and then he dies. What is that film called? You know that one I'm talking about. I yeah, no. You what was that? Sorry, you I, know. I know of it, but I don't remember the title. But we are here to talk about something on Yum Yum Podcast, the only Australian Babylon Five podcast, and the only podcast in all of the universe to have Yum Yum, because Star Trek Discovery was a series that we covered at one time, and it had a moment in which a lady sexily licked her lips and said Yum Yum out of nowhere, and we thought that was so absurd and so crazy that we had to name ourselves after it. But what else do we do here, Rachel, other than explain the Yum Yum phenomenon? We talk about sci-fi TV mostly, and we are in the process of covering season five of Babylon Five. We are, I would say, long-term fans of the original series, so we were very excited for this animated feature that we are going to be talking about today. Yes, an animated Babylon Five film written by JMS with、uh, some of the remaining cast from Babylon Five doing the voices of their characters, as well as some new people stepping in to do voices of people we know that are sadly no longer with us, as well as a、uh, one or two little new characters, and it is called The Road Home, and Rachel. How do you think IMDb describes this、uh, film?、Uh, John Sheridan gets sent、mm. through time and universes. Oh, very close. Now I'm reading the IMDb because it is straightforward and simple. And I don't want to give away too much for those who have not、uh, seen the film as of yet. We're going to discuss this. In the first little bit, in a variety of ways, but mainly we will go through it so we can give you our general impression on it, and then as we get further into the discussion, we'll dig our claws in and go through the details more finely. But here's what it has to say: John Sheridan finds himself transported through multiple timelines and alternate realities in a quest to find his way back home. What kind of energy? Does this facility use? It was in the release. Nobody reads press releases. What's the damned energy source? Tech tachyons. Oh crap! On this here podcast, we look for yum yum energy when it comes to Babylon Five. Who, in the given thing that we have watched, would have said yum yum? Jaka. What? 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 It's Jaka. Uh, explain yourself, Missy. I completely disagree. Oh, oh, it's too prim and proper. No, I am not talking about the. There's a particular version of Jakar that screams yummy yum. He's giving advice. He's speaking about the themes. He like if he went to the universe is yum yum, totally would buy it.、Wow. Totally would buy it. Obviously, Zathras. I've I've strong strong thoughts on this. Yes, this being a time traveling wavly story, Zathras is involved, and,、uh, and Zathras is Zathras brings yum yum. Zathras、yes. brings yum yum. But my person, my candidate is、uh, Lita Alexander. Oh also my! Also, a strong choice. Oh my! Pat Tolman is back with Fury, and she brings Y Y E with her like no one's business. Yes, she. I could hear her licking her lips、mm. and wanting to say yum、mm-hmm. yum in multiple line deliveries, but I could. JMS smacked her hand and said, "No, Pat, no,、oh, don't if, do that." If when they um th- like Lita and Jakar 
um, have a scene together and they do something. If when they did that thing, they said yum yum. While holding hands and screaming yep. to the skies and said, for you, Ryan and Rachel of Yum Yum Podcast, I would have. That, that would have made me really happy. That would have made me really happy. The thought of that makes me happy. Let's go over uh, in feelings on it. Uh, Spoiler-free thoughts and feelings. I didn't really have uh, an amount of excitement going in for this because Babylon 5 previously, when it's come back in movie form, whether or even spin-off form with Crusade and and Lost Tales and Legend of the Rangers. Has Stella? It's been not a stellar track record. No, it it's been bad often and it's been disappointing. Pathetic. And so my barest minimum quality that I needed this to be was not embarrassing. That's all I wanted was please don't be embarrassing. It doesn't meet that standard for you, Ryan. It goes it goes above that. And so I again wasn't really like look, I'm happy that it I was happy that it this exists. I wanted to see these characters again. I wanted JMS to play around in this universe he created, but from previous experiences, I wasn't chomping at the bit. So when it finally came and we sat down and watched it, I was ambivalent and I come out of it happy. I I liked it. I don't love it. Uh it's it's actually perfectly in line with every other B5 TV movie in which yes! it's good, yes! but it's not anything that I would say you have to go see. This isn't something that I would point out as a particular high standard of Babylon 5. It is yeah. serviceable. It does the job. Yeah. It hits the marks. It needs to hit. It's better than The Gathering. Yeah, well, it lacks pleasure thresholds, so... That is lacking. This is this is a little less horny than I was hoping for, especially since it's animated. Yeah. But I enjoyed it. I had a good time. I, I, I like it. Uh, I don't love it, though. Uh, what about you? I'm in a similar boat. I, I enjoyed it for the most part, but because it is very predictable, I found myself getting disengaged at various points. And then I was only really interested in <laughs> when a, a like a new character popped up or a new version of them popped up. Um, I didn't really care about the story. Yes, this is a story that is set piece after set piece, vignette after vignette. With the with the framework that this is in of John Sheridan is leaping around from one timeline to another, from a different universe to another, mm-hmm. you want to see certain things. You want, oh, are we going to see this character? Certain things from it as well. You're like, well, we're going to see multiple versions of at least these characters, right? And and what will that be? And oh, I never got to see this person talk to this person, so will this movie allow that to happen? And with it being animated as well, it opens up a whole canvas uh, to paint on with things that you could do that that weren't necessarily possible with the live-action series and the budget it had. And uh, I... Okay, so first off, for people wanting to know, this is for the fans. You cannot 100%. show this to someone who's never seen Babylon it's Five before. Not a casual viewing. This kind of thing is set firmly in the late game of season five, like the second last episode, and so it knows its target demographic. It knows who it's playing to, and but it does give you reminders of of the key things. So if you haven't watched it in a while. It gives you what you need, but it is assuming that you know this world and you're attached to the characters. It's like third space. It's comprehensive as a story. The characters make sense within the narrative, but it looks at you with this knowing gaze of you should be familiar with who these people are and the universe and the timeline that this takes place in. Yeah. And so you cannot show this to new people. And 
if you're someone who's just starting Babylon 5 and the new movie is out and you say, hey, that looks fun, I'm going to give it a watch, you might as well finish the series and then come back to this. Yes. That's the hard truth. Now, another thing to just put out there is... Is it good? Like we said, we enjoyed it, but but is it actually good? Would you say that this is this is good? Would would you would you say finally Babylon Five has 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 come back? It's hard to say because it's just like it's not bad, but I wouldn't unreservingly say it's good either. But it's hard to pinpoint what. My problems are without digging into it. I think the surface level way of saying it, I suppose, is that it's pitched at the fans, which are adults, but it to- its tone doesn't match the audience. And it goes very superficial with certain things and over explain certain things, particularly the themes. This is for an audience of adults and yet its sensibilities at times can be very much aimed towards children. And not because it's animated, that is not the reason. The animation can actually be very graphic at times. That's if you wanted to know the the animation can be brutal if it wants to. But it does have this overemphasis on telling us the themes and the messages. It is also done in uh, a way that is familiar with Babylon 5 in the early stages. When you look back at The Gathering or you look back at the early episodes of season 1, JMS is a writer finding his voice in this series, and it's the same here with with the 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 road home. It's JMS finding his voice again with Babylon Five, and so there's some stumbles. Things are immediately there, and other things take a little while to warm up, and other things just never get hot. Some characters are written as and performed as if. Not a day has passed since Babylon 5 wrapped up all those years ago. Sheridan is exactly how you remember him. Bruce Boxleitner nails it, but JMS knows the character. My, My short, simple review is lots has changed since Babylon 5 wrapped up, but one thing is a constant. John Sheridan is a kooky guy, and he hates his job. That like he hates his job so much as like he did in the series. He's such a kook. He's exactly like you know him to be, and that extends to some of the characters and others not so much. It's a little inconsistent in that way, and not, and it, I'm gonna say it too. It's not even because there are new voice actors. No, no. but uh, another thing that I just really wanted to say to everyone that wants to check this out is it's a well made it's well made i think the animation is uh very good it could be a little bit choppy at times but yeah. it gives you the the feel of babylon 5 yet it's pushed into the modern age the music is very fanciful a little too fanciful a little bit too uh overbearing for for my taste the aesthetics are there the 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 humor and the tone is far more JMSy than I was expecting. One thing I heard about this film before it came out, and I don't know if you heard anything before we watched it, but one thing I heard was there was this chatter from people who saw it at uh, San Diego San Diego Comic Con of it has the Marvel type humor that MC MCUfication. No, no, this is. Go back and watch uh, Babylon Five, and yeah. especially Crusade. Also, like, this is this is old. This is old. JMS, JMS baby did help write for Marvel, so his sensibilities align with a lot of those tropes. But it doesn't feel Marvel. It feels JMS. Oh yeah, to me at least. 
What's something else that uh, you want to go over in just this overview of things before we dive deeper and go into spoilers someone comes up to you rachel and says oh should i should i check out uh the road home what are some things that you want to grab them by the shoulders and let them know (laughs) it is worth your time it's not gonna knock your socks off but it is worth your time and you don't need to rewatch the series in order to enjoy it It does not feel like a departure or an inaccuracy or the creator coming back with an arrogance and saying, I could do it way better than I did before and misunderstanding the work. It's not the new Matrix movie. It's not the new Matrix movie. It's not that type of meta deconstructionist thing, but his his mentality, JMS's mentality and the movie's mentality is very much reminiscent of Crusade. That's very interesting to me because uh, one of the complaints I have about JMS as a, as a creative voice near the tail end of the Babylon 5 franchise with stuff like Crusade and the movies and Legend of the Rangers and Lost Tales is... He has uh, he, the, his blade is a little bit more dulled when it comes to yeah. the things he wants to critique and comment on, and so I haven't watched too much JMS stuff outside of B five after it. I've seen Sense Eight. I don't mind it, but even then, he just lacks that cutting quality to what he's writing. He he's far more of a sentimentalist. After a certain point, there's far more yeah. of a warmer, fuzzier, softer, romantic feel to mm-hmm. this. And if you if you like that, if you like that, then this is going to be for you. I have had a flip-flopping relationship with it over the years, and I think The Road Home finds a perfect middle ground of this attitude that JMS has had in his writings since Season 5 of Babylon 5. Yeah. I feel like all of the characters are way more open about their emotions. Yeah. (laughs) Which increases um, the sentimentality in different ways throughout the movie. We are watching through Season 5 right now. And the thing to define Season 5 is one word. Bittersweet. Emphasis on bitter. And this... Pretty much everything since season five has been less of bittersweet and almost like a reaction to, wow, I really made something that was quite a hard pill to swallow in that final year or two. I want to have something a little bit nicer. Let's have some fun. Let's have some fun. So definitely worth checking out. It's only 80 minutes. Two. That's the thing. It's only 80 minutes. It's not a huge investment of your time. It doesn't screw around with what we had seen before in a way that will make you flip a table or lose your shit. Have you seen my blue socks? There are plenty of socks right over there. They're not blue. Yes, good point. The blue socks are my lucky socks. All socks are lucky socks because at the rate you lose them, you're lucky to have any at all. Let's... Rip off the band-aid and start spoiling stuff. Let's talk about those new voice actors. That was a big controversial thing. It was necessary. It was necessary. (sighs) Like, to tell this story, you need those characters and those actors aren't around anymore. So, if you want to do this this way, that's what's got to be done. And... I think they do a pretty good job overall, but it, it I found that Delenn to be the most distracting. It is a, a tough thing to really accept if you are a diehard fan of this series because those actors from the show were the, the characters yeah. and it is unfortunate that a lot of the cast has passed away at rather young ages. And so... You can't bring Babylon Five back again, really, because yeah, most of them do are a gone. Straight up reboot. You can't just do a straight up revival or reboot or whatever. And so, animation is also a great medium to do this because oh, you could just have I was sound alikes. 
Bruce didn't sound like really much older. No, Bruce just sounds pretty much yeah, himself, and, like, and so does uh, what- Pat Tolman as well. She sounds yeah. pretty pretty on point, but. I think she actually did the best job when it comes to vocally capturing what their character was from the show. Bruce is a close second, but very, very close. It's a fine hair. But choosing soundalikes to play these people is going to be a swing and a miss, depending who it is. And you said Delenn, but you also said something that I actually thought was true going in, and I don't think is true coming out, which is... You can't tell this story without these characters. I only think that this story needed Delenn and Zathras in terms of people who are no longer with us. Delenn is pivotal because this is a story about romance. This is a story about his love of Delenn and Zathras because he's the kooky time-traveling guy. But Garibaldi, Sinclair... Franklin. Franklin... They all serve a function to the story, yeah. but honestly... They're not required, no. But... And I didn't miss them when they weren't there. No, like no. I, did, I actually missed yeah. a, like, Delenn when she wasn't here because she actually impacted the narrative yeah, so I, greatly. I agree with you. Like, it's it's not everybody, but those people who are needed are really needed. And because this is for the fans... There are a lot of other people that, like, they would be pissed if they didn't get to see. There's so many that aren't here. There's no, there's no Zach. We get uh, an image of Via, but no Via. There's, we could go down the list. Marcus is here, but it's not actually the Jason Carter. I don't, I don't have enough time to open up the can of worms there. I don't know what's going on with Babylon Five and Jason Carter because even he didn't know about this movie, and I know. The the moment with Marcus is just basically one line, yeah, so they they not, they're not going to hire him it's... there. But, uh, yeah, I was expecting to hate the new voice actors, but I didn't really care about any of them. Uh, they didn't make me like any of the characters or no. hate any of them. They were a function. They just yes. did it. And my biggest critique is... None of the new voices, except for the Zathras voice, because the guy who does Zathras, of like he does a good impression of Tim Choate, but he he adds his own thing. Yeah, and that also has the benefit of it. it's not the exact same Zathras. Mm-hmm. So it can be an impression. But the rest of them, they they could evoke like they could put on an impression of whoever they were, but they didn't bring uh, life to any of those characters. Even the great Phil Lamar. Phil Lamar is a talented yeah. voice actor, but that's my biggest slam against the, the these new actors, is I don't care if they don't sound exactly like Michael O'Hare. The same guy who does Zathras does Sinclair. Sounds nothing like Sinclair. The voice isn't deep no. enough. It isn't stoic enough. It isn't mannered enough. But that's all fine. Yeah. If there was the 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 life and flavor of that character seeped through the performance and I just didn't get it from no. most of them. And this is when you and I are going to lock horns. I thought the chick who did Delenn did it well. No, I thought she she no, embodied it. Her accent I, was a little weird, but I, I thought she did the best job. I don't want to say that I think her performance is bad. It was that I notice the differences between her voice and Mira Falan's voice the mm. most. Oh, yeah. I kept, when she was talking, my brain kept on going, that's not really Delenn. Mm-hmm. But she was doing a really good job, and I appreciated what she was doing. But I couldn't get over on this first watch her sounding different. And that's completely on me. Oh, no, I think it's a fair complaint because Mira was, as a cast member, she was honestly the heart of the series. She was there from the beginning. She's this strong, powerful presence, both her character and that actress. And so it's always going to be a lose-lose when it comes to replacing her. 
were they replacing any of them, honestly? Yeah, but yeah, like they did a I, really good job with casting in the first place, and we've I, I thought sung the, the praises yeah, of that before. But I thought the the actress, uh, she had a bit of a, she had more of a Dracula accent than I was expecting. I I felt some of that lightness of Delenn as well as this performer bringing their own spin on the character, and that's that's always more yeah. important to me. And again, the Zathras voice really good he did a good job added his own thing but the rest of them uh, like sinclair i said it he's just he just sounds like a guy yeah there's never a moment of him feeling like a gruff soldier which michael o'hare could do or the the pondering reflective philosophy type which oh michael o'hare sounds sound like all the time as well what did you think of jakar I, I, overall, I got used to it. With Jakar, I, I just sort of resigned myself to it not sounding like Andreas hmm. quickly. Because he, he had a unique voice as yeah, well. Yeah, like he, he had one and he, the way that he performed Jakar was very unique as well on top of that and it's just like finding somebody that has those vocal qualities is quite difficult and then you don't you, what territory do you go into he sounded british to me yeah the version of jakai just sounded so british it was very strange i just couldn't get over it it's no. just he sounds like a british man hello there he sounded like a, a robin Sachs. Yeah. If they said this was this was Nicole, I would have agreed. I went would have nodded my head and go gone, yeah, of course that's Nicole. And here's a crazy thing too, with Jukar, and we'll get into more of the story and character stuff, but most of the time his function would have just been Lorian. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know what to make of that. It's just, it has to be Jakar because we all know Jakar and we all love Jakar and it would be weird not to have him in there. But 90% of the time, what he's doing in this he's Lorian is, is, is Lorien. It's yeah. Lorien. It's it's 100% Lorien. What did you what did you feel about Phil Lamar as Dr. Stephen Franklin? Because he is the recognizable voice actor. The rest of these people that we've talked about not so much. They're up and coming or they do certain types of things like video games and, and anime. But Phil Lamar, we are watching the new Futurama as we do this. So we we are hearing Phil Lamar right now. So what did you think of him as Franklin? I thought he was pretty good. I thought he did a, a, a solid job as Franklin, even if he did pronounce Pakmara wrong. That was his first line. The hardest part of dealing with the Pakmara, who, as you know, are carrion eaters. Pakmara, Pakmara, Pakmara. Bruce Boxleitner, man. Fucking great. It's like he's never stopped playing Sheridan. He, it's almost, it was, if you said that he recorded this when they did, like, The Lost Tales or when they did uh, one of the movies, I would believe you 100%. He sounded fantastic. And he knew the cadence of JMS dialogue. Yeah. That's the thing that's really missing from the new voice actors is they don't know the specific rhythm and cadence to that dialogue, but Brucey did. He also was unafraid to take massive pauses between certain words and lines, and it just made it feel all the more natural and real. Bruce has had some experience doing voice work, but he's not the most prolific voice actor, but I thought he really was a standout during all of this. Uh, what do you think, Bruce and, and Sheridan? Because we knew this was going to be a big old Sheridan tale. What did you think it's of old Sheridan? Sheridan show, baby. Um, I en- really enjoyed it. I was worried that he was going to sound like an old man uh, because of, you know, the recent thing with the latest Indiana Jones movie and how... They de-aged Harrison Ford's face. Oh, I thought you were going to actually say Futurama with but, fries. But no, <laughs> no I, went, I went with the movie comparison, but yeah. Yeah, Futurama does it too. Or The Simpsons, <laughs> where it's like, he's a he's a 10-year-old and they sound like a, like a six-year-old woman. Ah, uh, yeah. 
It's because Bruce, when he, I mean, he has a naturally gruff voice, but the way he does Sheridan always has like this boyish charm, even though his voice is always raspy. Yeah. He, hey, golly gee, Delenn, where are my socks? Ah, where are my socks at? I need my lucky blue socks. So even if his voice the fact is, that he remembers his socks that he wore when he took over the station, <laughs> which means like, did he choose them on purpose? Oh, of course. They they knew how to write. He knew how to. JMS knew how to write Sheridan. We we just cut to this grand opening to hard cut to Sheridan being a dork, being an absolute whiny, superstitious kook. Yeah. Uh, that's the best way to describe him. He's just a kook. He loves no oranges. No oranges though. No orange juice. What the fuck, man? When he went to that farm, I was expecting some more. I was expecting some oranges. I wanted see. I wanted oranges. I wanted orange trees. I wanted orange blossoms. Wanted all of it, but instead we got corn. Just old corn. Uh, who were you happiest to see again? And slash here again. Lita. She's great. Pat's great as Lita. Lita is great. Well, thank you for your very concise <laughs> thoughts there, Rachel. I like what she has to offer. I like the, her engagement with all the other characters, her banter with Jakar. Love it. Mm. Love it. Um, I liked the different versions of her and how they were similar but different and how she brought that through in her vocal performance just a little bit just a little bit like not too much not so it's like can't you tell i'm a different person now <laughs> um it's just the different variants of uh i feel like her she were, like they were in different eras of that character's progression yeah. so one of them's best friends with jakar like, and they're rambunctious yes and the other one is coming in as I work here. I'm a professional telepath who does the things that they ask of me. And Pat Tolman really got to play those different sides of, of Lita that we did get to see in the show yeah. as well. And so she could just touch back into that. She was funny. I think that is the thing that makes her really stand out as our old friends again is Lita got a lot of funny lines and quips and quirks, but in the way that it was uh, oh so Lita, because that's the thing too, when we're going back through the series, Lita gets a lot of like funny slash badass lines. Yeah. And Pat Tolman was always great at chewing through those, the, yeah. the burn you bastards. Or the whole sequence where she takes over the Zocalo with her brain and Sheridan has to threaten her with her with his PPG. And 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 Pat Tolman always is rising to the challenge of those. And just Lita gets nothing but that. I did get a massive guffaw out of this, this sequence where Lisa and Jakar have to help throw a switch to blow up Babylon 5. It's up to them to do it. They've both been injured, but they're going to help each other and work together because friendship is magic. And they flip the switch and the shadows are shooting at them and shoot them both dead. And I afford at that because JMS finally got to kill Lita on screen. He's been trying <laughs> yeah. for so long, but 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 Pat Tolman just keeps sidestepping. Oh no, I can't be in Crusade all oh, <laughs> scheduling things. Uh, whoopsie, I'm not gonna be in Lost Tales. Whew, and just she keeps dodging and ducking and weaving these opportunities for JMS to finally fucking kill Lita Alexander. And then he got it. He got to do it, but I can already tell Pat Tolman standing over him while he writes a script and set and she says yeah yeah but that's a that's a version of lisa <laughs> okay you got to make sure a version of me lives at the end playing i don't know cards or something all right oh that was a wonderful scene at the ending where she's playing uh she's doing this card thing with uh linea and she is just 
shit-talking Lanier. And that's a duo we never really got to see in B5 is Lita and Lanier. They didn't always get to have buddy-buddy adventures. So the promise of that dynamic, and that's the thing too, like that's what I want more of from this is giving us those pairings that we didn't always get to have in the series. Yeah, Lisa was... uh, my favorite, honestly. I mean, Sheridan is a standout because he's the main character and JMS has not lost the thread of Sheridan at all. But with Lita, it was just great to see her running around and shooting people and using her brain to mind control people and flip people out. And her and Jakar being buddy-buddy was absolutely delightful. Uh, a weird characterization for Lanier who's barely in the movie, by the way. Lania has, what, like three scenes, perhaps? Uh, If you're lucky, Bill Moomy did return, and Bill Moomy is very well known for having major problems with what happened to Lania, how they handled the character of Lania. And so to bring him back, this is his first time back, this is finally, Lania has returned Bill Moomy as Lanier is back. And he's a boob. He's an idiot. He's a boob. I can imagine Bill Moomy saying to JMS, look, 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 I don't like what happened to Lanier. Can you can you not make him an incel this time? And JMS cracks his knuckles and just says, okay, I'll make him an idiot. He's, he's dumb as a bag of rocks oh, in so this. Dumb, so dumb. He's, Everything. He, Everything out of his mouth is so dumb. What do you think? What do you think of that? It's frustrating because the Lanier that we got to know, like he starts off being very competent and well versed in the things that Temple prepared him for. But he is childish and, then, and naive. Then through the experiences on B five, he's changed. He develops. He grows. He becomes closer. Mm-hmm. Doing. Love lawn teenager. Yes. For better or worse. And he becomes an edge lord. In the opening, when Sheridan is being all Mr. I need my lucky socks. It ain't the same without my lucky blue socks. I can't find them. And he spitefully just doesn't wear socks when he is leaving Babylon 5. I oh, that was classic Sheridan, by the way. I'm I, I just tutted and went, ah yeah, that's when he's him. like you shouldn't have said anything. <laughs> you shouldn't have gone up against me, Dylan. And and Bill Moomy's line delivery about how he's not wearing socks. It was very uh, slapsticky and silly. And Lania has these bug out eyes. He he just comes across as really really just. He's taken a few few dumb pills over the years and in the end we see an alternative universe version of him and you could excuse it as it's the younger Lanier where he's naive and innocent before all of that growth that you just went over Rachel but I I just I I don't know I found it on a meta textual level hilarious that Bill Moomy's had all of these long diatribes about the handling of Lanier and finally he gets to come back to play Lanier this is in you could imagine in his eyes the redemption of the the, the Lanier character, and he's a fool. Perhaps you're not projecting hard enough. I am projecting at full P five. That's not the problem. Problem is telepathy requires two minds. Sorry. Nothing. Nothing. Keep going. Ten of spades. Someone please kill me. You know, Avonova was here too. By the way. And Claudia Christian is great. We love Claudia, but I was actually quite shocked at how little she actually mattered to the story. She was yeah. she was in the film a lot, but mm-hmm. she was never like she was in the movie a lot. But I never felt like Avonova was in the story. Yeah, the fact that we neglected her from the list of essentials does give that away. Is that disappointing? Yes. Yeah, because. We missed out on Bonavar in season five f- for whatever reason it actually is, but the fact is still there. So it's like, oh, we finally get her back. And she she's in it a good amount, but she's not in it. She's there. 
Yeah, she she gets to have some great line deliveries, but Ivanova really isn't a character that matters to the story. It's just she is a character in the story. Ivanova is here too, by the way. I am disappointed actually. I I I was I was wanting for her to be far more of a leading presence than she was. But it it really is just pure Sheridan. Well, but but Lisa and and uh, Lockley and even say Zathras all have like their big moments that you can point to. Of one of the, I don't know, she gets to shoot a PPG at some shadows while they storm at her. The a, pool uh, scene. The the pool scene. Uh, but again, that's Londo. I I go Londo, Londo, Londo. I don't think of one of her. Of one of her really had any particular standout. No. Things here. She Not was where just, it was just. Well, I was more excited to see an animated version of Corwin running around in the background, um, like the. Uh, well, she has the final didn't line. Have, yeah, this didn't, moment didn't hit quite as hard because it is very reminiscent of something that happened in the show, which is her doing the final SOS before Babylon Five blows up yes the callback to that that could have been her like big moment but it it didn't come across that way for us on this watch her big moment is that she wraps out the film and she looks us in the eyes basically and says there will be more adventures in this new universe that you are seeing right now but uh, i don't know I I i was hoping for more than what we actually got. And now let's get into the true craziness. You know, if 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 you're a Babylon 5 fan and you've watched this movie or you haven't, you know, let's be real honest here. Let's sit down, let's drop the weapons, let's drop any kind of pretense. We were all here to see Londo at some point. Peter, Peter is still here. Peter's still with us. He's a great guy. He has a cameo. He did the audiobook for JMS. He does conventions. We were all here to see some Londo stuff, but he does not come into the story until way late into the game. And I almost forgot that he was supposed to be here. Yeah, so did I. I was just like, wait, Londo was in the trailer. What? Mm-hmm. Hey, where is Londo? Uh, I want to drop a a bombshell here, and I know some people may disagree, but the story was about Sheridan and his journey, and it was so well told and so well realized when it came to that. I didn't really mind the lack of Londo because it would have just been fan service yeah, if he was in been it there more, so that it was there, and he's only in. Two scenes, really. He's in the pool scene in an alternative world where Earth is getting bombed with the moon from the Vorlons, and he's in the final scene where it's him and Jakar barking at each other and sharing jabs and jibes with one another. I don't think he's in any other scenes, and if he is, it's not standing out. Mm -hmm. But my truth, my my big bombshell is I don't care, honestly, because as much as I love Londo and as much as I would have loved more of Peter to do his wonderful accent yeah. and voice work. It Londo wasn't didn't, needed. It wasn't needed. Just like how Zach Allen and wasn't needed I in this like story, so he wasn't here. I on that. Like, they could have, you know, switched out one of the scenes with Garibaldi to be Zach if the timeline, like, you know. If they wanted to, yeah. Yeah, but they didn't. They chose to just stick with Garibaldi being the head of security and involved in these various points, which was fine. The lack of Londo is not a complaint or a fault in the film. The lack of Londo is emblematic of the strength of the road home, which is keep it simple, stupid. Yeah. Mm K-I-S-S. Great writer's note, 
Keep that in your brain if you're a writer. Keep it simple, stupid. Because if you overcomplicate something, especially like this, which is a time travel story with multiverses, and there's enough going on already. There's, and this is also a fan service movie, a reunion tour for some of this cast and crew, as well as uh, maybe a backdoor pilot for more. That's a lot. That's a lot. It, it's it's carrying a lot. <laughs> and yet. It was simple. Mm-hmm. I I took it as it was. It was maybe a bit too simplistic, honestly. I would have yeah. liked it to be a little bit more complex in its messages and its themes. But the fact that Londo is here very minimally is a show of restraint on JMS's part that may disappoint many people. Uh, I must admit that when the movie was over, I did think back of how little he was in it and sighed because... This could be the last time. There's always that in the air of, this could be the last time we didn't get Londo in the Lost Tales. We didn't get Londo in The Legend of the Rangers or some of the other movies. Nothing's to be taken for granted. If you put a gun against my head and said, Ryan, in The Road Home, the animated film, who will be in it more? Captain Elizabeth Lockley or... Londo Malari. Londo, you would bet on Londo. And guess what? It's Lockley. I would, I would be dead. I would be on the fucking ground with my head blown off because Lockley is in this movie so fucking much. And, and I'm, oh my God, what did you think about Lockley being here? I was fine with her. I was fine with her. I feel a bit out of touch with her because we're just at the start of season five. So I'm still at that stage where I'm like, Ugh, you. You're, who are you? How dare you come in here thinking you're a big character? You're not a Vonifer. And it's so stupid that you're Sheridan's ex-wife. Tracy Scoggins uh, is, I just, I like her voice in general, so I was happy to hear it. Yeah. I could not, I could not pass the character design, though. She, She's the one that does not look anything like yeah. the character. The rest of them... I can see it. Some of them have a bit of a weirdness in the like the blankness of the face, the lacking of a uh, a line of the nose or the eyes a little bit too far apart for my taste. But Lockley, she just looked like some lady. Yeah. And the craziest thing to say about, and this is, I, I'm just going to say it's true, Tracy Scoggins looks like a cartoon in real life because she has like these massive eyes, these 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 high cheekbones. She has like this very chiseled. She's like chiseled, like Lockley's oh, fucking ripped. Like when uh, she does those like sit ups on, on the, the glass table, not, not sit ups, like crunches the, and the stuff. Dips, yeah, like tricep dips or something. She has like this, uh, you know, very iconic hairdo that you could have done. And here she just looked like some brunette lady. I don't know. I like. I couldn't. I like every time she came on the screen. I had to remind myself that this is Elizabeth Lockley here, and got to give it up to JMS for keeping Lockley just in the roster of characters because she wasn't a popular one because she did replace Ivanova. But Tracy no, Scoggins is. They a, didn't erase her. Tracy Scoggins is a dedicated performer. She's always been a fan of the property and she's always been active within the community she does the convention she was in the lost tales she was in crusade so i like the the respect shown for lockley and for tracy scoggins but we did say that there was a lack of londo but the londo that we did get was was good yeah it was good it wasn't top tier londo but it was good londo I loved it. <laughs> I love him. So would him you say it's top tier, Lindo? Fucking hell. It was well, not in dramatic sense, but in the sense of here he is with Avonova drinking wine and celebrating to the end of the world because they're both pessimistic assholes. Yes, I loved that. Okay. In fact, I'm angry that we didn't get more time spent on that scene. Not just because it's Londo, but I I love their attitude and their vibe and just their defeat. They're, 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 they're so 
cynical and, ah, Sheridan, ah, you died. If this is you post-death, you're looking pretty great. But I think you could look even better. Oh, my God. He just had all of those Londo snappy one-liners after the other. And with Peter having aged, and he hasn't done the accent in a while, that is different. But this Londo is an alternative university one, and it's in a certain period of time, and he has this malaise. Mm -hmm. The the difference in Peter's uh, line deliveries matched the the malaise of Londo during that. So I, I actually would have liked more of that sequence. I, I really like I really yeah, loved it. That one I because they have the contrivance um set into the script of he's going to like Sharon is gonna transport at the most inopportune moments because stress exacerbates it. And it's going to get quicker. But that was the one where I was just like, oh, they just wanted to move on. They, they just had to keep going. I thought like, the Zaha, that- I actually thought the Zaha Doom one was the worst when it comes to that. To, yeah. uh, to, to a point of which I said, why did they even bother doing it? Because it was to set up that this is where the shadows came from. Okay, great. They, they didn't even make a point of Anna. During yeah, that, that was there was a, a weird woman. There was a thing. woman's voice on the radio, yeah. and I thought they were going to say that it was Anna, or he would recognize it and say, "Anna, get out of there!" And she's like, "John, what are you doing here?" And then he would, yeah. then he would transport. But they didn't do that, no. and so I can't give them credit for that. They may no. say, "JMS," I know JMS. He will say on the audio commentary track, or he will say on Twitter, "That was Anna." Tough shit, dude. Shut you, it. If it is, you didn't, like do, it. you didn't play with it, so it doesn't mean anything to me. It's- just a very short sound. Just Anna. Get back to base right now. Who, who is this? It's too late. We're already deep inside. The walls. The walls are moving. There's something behind them. We. We're not alone. They're coming toward us. They're. John has been hit by those blasted tachyons. tachyons. And it makes him become I'm the TV. Stuck in time. No, excuse me, excuse me. It makes him become the 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 great television series sliders. They are just doing sliders in this movie. I know. Is that our good- the copyright that Zathras was? No, talking he was about? talking about fucking Lost in Space, which I can't wait to talk about that because that's in my notes of jokes. He he he's doing sliders. John is doing sliders, and I know our friend Ben from the Last Best Babylon Five podcast is going to be so exhilarated when he watches this because he loves sliders, and this is just fucking sliders. And the saddest thing to say is I didn't care about any of the time travel multiverse stuff. I do not have multiverse fatigue which is happening right now because everything is multiverse is because i don't watch any of those things not because i hate multiverses it's just then i'm not watching mcu right now no i'm not watching this i'm not watching we watched that. the newest spider-verse it was fine but i'm not really diving into the multiverse fatigue but this here i i kind of wanted them to do more of what endgame did mm-hmm. if they did which is John revisiting events we got to see in the show and fucking around with them. And you could argue that's what's going on, but it just doesn't, it just doesn't have that oomph. There's a scene where Zathras shows on the screen of like all of these events. And it's like, and I was like, oh, look, I remember that scene from that episode. Wouldn't it be cool if John was there right now? I was just like, oh, I look forward to somebody else going through all of these and then doing a blog post or something so I can look at them and go, oh, okay, that was all of the bits that they decided to put in there. In a time travel story and or a multiverse story. Yes. Isn't one of the appeals seeing a character want to change things yeah but john does not want to change things he wants to leave yeah that is the thrust of the story is oh no i've done the time thing before i've got to leave i'm over it i'm over it i'm out where's my exit ticket am i just too catered to by that trope or that given of a science fiction 
travely wavely story of oh when you travel back he i want him to talk to anna and say get out of there anna and try and alter the timeline because I'm of his own selfish needs or no. his human want of that yeah i'm not gonna say no where but i i think that's also something that JMS has used to his advantage in the past is your familiarity with tropes and using it uh, as ammunition one way or another against the audience or for the audience. Even with War Without End, it wasn't like that. They had their little moments like Sinclair trying to warn Garibaldi, but I also also can see why they don't want to do that end game approach because that is with what War Without End Part Two did, which is let's insert them into Babylon Squared, and now we're filling in the gaps. But I don't know. I just I left. I was pretty limp when it came to all of the time hopping and the running around. I I looked at it more well, as I've said up the top that the story was not what I enjoyed about this. I liked the story as just an excuse to do yeah. characterful stuff for Sheridan. Mm-hmm. I liked the story of Sheridan, but the means to get there was uninspired, limp fine it was yeah it exists but it isn't what i'm gonna think about what i'm gonna think about is sheridan and him learning about love and life and loss and his place in the universe and that is the more like compelling stuff and the longer lasting stuff than, oh, look, it's a Vonover in this timeline, or look, it's Londo and he doesn't know this, or hey, it's Jakar and he's the universe, I guess. I don't know. I, uh, yeah. Uh, is there anything about how this story did the time travel or the multiverse stuff that did work for you? I, I, Liked how the explosions kept on getting bigger when he left. I I like the way that they built up the tension with that. I was like, oh, they didn't have to do that. But it was cool. It was a, a thing to amp up the stakes that each time he is stuck in a timeline, he is making things gradually worse. So the scorch and then the eventual explosion gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I, until you just vocalized it, I didn't even think of it. It was there. Of course it was there. But since this is my first time watching it, it it didn't register until you just said it. So good work there on, on the movie's part and on uh, JMS's part because it is uh, a thing that exists there of it's just he's unraveling the universe. And it goes to Zathras's point of instead of the Big Bang, this is a big silence. And, oh, I love that concept. Yes. Yes. That was like, ooh, that's some nerdy shit right there. Instead of destroying the universe in a way that you would expect, like with the moon hitting Earth, it is, in fact, you are just undoing everything and it is just reverse, reversing and collapsing and becoming quieter and more silent because... With each thing you do, it is trying to course correct and and it is just going to keep mounting on top of itself until it collapses in. That is a cool idea, as well as a, a neat thing I like sci-fi-wise was uh, quantum communication. Zathras brings up that he is having conversations with other Zathrases from different timelines and universes and they just keep in touch. And that was just a thing that he said and I like it, and I actually wish that they did that because there's this moment where there's like a million Zathrases because he's cloned himself, which is different to his brothers, apparently, but this is he cloned himself, and that was just a visual gag, honestly. Yeah. And I thought it was it's a like, waste oh. of potential. Oh, okay. That's all you're doing with this? I took it as, oh, these are all the other Zathrases from the different timelines, and he's made... Uh, he's made a group of them like in the Spider-Verse movies, like, oh, he's Council of Zathrases. But instead it was like this random one-off gag and it didn't really mean anything. And no. it was just like a kooky, weirdo visual. And yeah. I don't know, it kind of left me lacking. Yeah. The time travel 
has to end when John realizes love is the key. And he knows this because Ugh. he talks to Jakar at the edge on the rim. And Jakar Look, is there's a not, literal rim. Yeah, there's a little one rim. One side has everything, one side has nothing. Do you remember that gag in Futurama where they go to the edge of the galaxy and it's a brick wall oh, yeah. and they look through the thing and across the edge of the galaxy is another universe it's where they're wearing cowboy, cowboy hats. hats? I wanted that to happen. Yes! <laughs> hey, look. Hey, look, it's me over there and I'm drinking, what is that, tomato juice? No, thanks. <laughs> and he, and then he drinks orange juice and throws the glass on the ground. <laughs> No, to but prove he who he is. He wouldn't dare waste a drop of orange juice yeah. that far out in space. That right? is true. It's, it's a commodity. It's a commodity out there. Uh, okay, let's just rip off the Band-Aid. You are going to love this movie or hate this movie, depending if you ascribe to love saves us all in a story. The love is the key... <sighs> this is uh, as egregious as that one episode of Doctor Who where they revisited uh, Craig. Craig and he's a dad now and he's becoming a Cyberman but he breaks free of becoming a Cyberman because he hears his child scream and the pure love of being a dad <laughs> makes him Hearing break a through. Hearing baby cry. Makes him break through the sci- science. And I hate no, emotions that. Emotions overwhelm the Cybermen. Yeah, so I hate the core message of uh, The Road Home so very yeah, much. Duh. Not a fan, not a fan, especially because it, it isn't just that it is that message, but because it slaps you in the face and then it backhands you on the other side. Did you know about the and observer then slaps effect? And slams and slaps and did, slaps. Did you know the, slaps, did you know, slaps. Rachel, did you know he's the observer? And do you know what quantum physics has to say about observers? And the observer effect? Yeah, the message, if you aren't a fan of it, is definitely not going to work for you because JMS beats you over the head with it and shoves it down your throat. It's repeated too many times. There was a hilarious moment, and I wish we recorded this. This is like one of the very few times I wish we recorded our live reactions to things. We go to Zaha Doom. There's the Icarus. And you said, Rachel, oh, yeah, look, just like how they told us on ISN, Cut to literally like a microsecond later, the flashback to the ISN sequence of them telling us that. <laughs> and it was uncanny. It was like fucking uncanny of Rachel living through a criticism, we're going to say, which is, you didn't, you did it. You didn't need to tell us. We got it. We got it. We fucking got it, baby. We're not dumb. Because again, this is for the fans. This isn't for children. This isn't for new people. You don't need to shovel it in our mouths like that, man. No. <laughs> we fucking understood no. what was happening. Even before I saw the Icarus, I knew it was Zaha Doom. I got it. Or Zaha Boom, Zaha as he said. Boom. You heard, You heard me. Again, Bruce Boxleitner makes some of those weird, corny JMS lines sound natural. Yeah. He's it's a great eight actor. It's a gift. It is, it is a gift, but love well, is the gi- key. It, it's a gift. That Bruce gives us. It is a gift he gives us. Love is the key, Jakar talk. Jakar slash the universe because Jakar is the universe in this movie. Sheridan is transported through time and space and he's dropped on the rim. And yes, there's this embodiment of the universe because of the Minbari belief of the universe is this great Which, consciousness trying to understand just itself. Just in case you didn't pick up, was the Jakar that I was talking about at the top with YYE. Oh, he was the YYE yes. one. Okay. he Again, I found him too prim and proper for, for YYE. I found him too buttoned up. He also was dressed like a villain for some reason. The green and purple does not suit Jakar's mm. aesthetics. What? Okay, let's just say what we think about this scene here because this is the moment in which the writing tells us all this is what the movie's about. Yeah. This scene not the best. What do you think? Well, why why isn't it the best? And is it just because you don't like the core message? Yeah, that's a big part of it. It's a big part of it. And it 
it also kind of felt like it wanted to have the two climaxes, the action climax and the theme climax. And I'd already gotten to the point of understanding everything that like Sheridan sort of learns to appreciate in this scene with Jakar long before they got to this point. So I just found it frustrating. Oh, did you figure out it was Delenn chasing him the whole time, trying to get after him like she was before? But he's saying, stay back, stay back each time, just like he did to her before. Uh, Yeah, and how when he did get taken by her, he was redirected back on course. Oh, good one. I, I I just find it corny. Okay, that's it. That's the real thing of it is when a movie or a show explicitly yeah, says that it. love is the key, that love is what makes the universe, that love is the strongest force of all time, I cringe. I roll my eyes, I cross my arms because it's too hokey. Now, <laughs> do I disagree? No. I'm not disagreeing with it, but I think it's... Love is very important. Love is important to the human condition, but I don't like when you get into a sci-fi thing where it's like, no, love is the key thing to all of existence. And it doesn't uh, align with how Babylon 5 operates to to myself either. I think Babylon 5 has had a a pitch-perfect relationship when it comes to love being a guiding force in the universe, where you have characters that say it is and others who don't. And the series itself leaves it up to you. It doesn't hammer it in so aggressively that it makes you bleed. And this here is just... What I was saying at the top of how JMS, after season five, has become a very mushy, sentimental guy in his writing. He's gone for the simple. And it's just like we, part of what we love about Babylon 5 so much is that it lives and it digs into the grey. It makes you uncomfortable. And this was sweet and pleasant and nice all the way through. There was never any of that... Instead of being Grit. bittersweet, it's sickly sweet. It's sickly sweet. And the 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 scene with Jakar where he says, uh, was it like, de- de- the destruction is easy and hate doesn't last forever, but love, great stuff. And I can imagine Jakar saying it, but I don't know. It was just, once they opened that valve, because it was dripping throughout the movie, but once they opened this valve, we just got flooded like the moon hitting the earth and the city getting flooded with this rather bizarrely way. <laughs> with this unnervingly greatly animated water, by the way. That was yeah. like the greatest animation in the movie was the water, which I was uh, stunned by how great it was. I, I was like, did they 2D animate this? It looked really good. Hmm. Uh, but They did have some 2D animation credits. Yeah, so I, I wouldn't be shocked. But uh, yeah, I just lost it. I would have been happy with... The, the simplistic thing, again, simple, 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 of it's Delenn chasing him and the fact that she's chasing him gives him the understanding that this Jakar speech gives of not taking for granted those around you that you love and taking the world around you for granted because yeah. Sheridan at the beginning was. He loves Delenn, he tells her as much, but at the same time he's in his own head about legacy and about his future and mm-hmm. what he doesn't want. They were he so starts... upfront about their feelings. It was weird. But that's their relationship. Like... That's always been their relationship. Yeah. But ju- I suppose, like, just the scene with the two of them when he's getting, like, the deja vu mm. moments still, like, before Why are you he standing gets... in the shadows? Yeah. Um, just the way that they the candor that they had with each other in that it felt a little bit too much in a weird way for me. I'm not saying that it doesn't make sense because it does, especially for them at that point in their relationship. But it's also, to me, it's just like, well, John already knows this. I don't need an interstellar alliance. I don't need the stars or any of the worlds spinning around them. I only need you, Dylan. You're my universe. The brightest star in my sky. I like this idea of he needs to grow up 
but it should have been more of an emphasis on he needed to grow up about his role in the universe but they made it more about like not only his role in the universe but his his role as like a, a supporting partner yeah. and rom- like it was all romantically based yeah. and never Never, ever, no. ever, within the confines of this 80-minute production, did I question that he didn't know that love was important? No, no, no. It was more like, John, wake the fuck up and realize that you have responsibilities. Mm-hmm. You can't just say, oh, I don't have my socks. Things are going to go poorly now. That's immature of you. You're going to be the president of this interstellar alliance and you're bitching about having to open shopping malls. Like That's the stuff that needs to be critiqued, that needs to be worked on, needs to be straightened out. But that would be harder. Would it? That would, no, that would be harder for them to do in an 80 minute thing that would have taken a, a different road and that's not it doesn't feel like that exploration is the purpose of this film i think otherwise i think that you could do it but it's oh, easier yeah, yeah, it's that's easier what I mean. on a broad strokes level because this is taking broad strokes yeah this this is the Paint by numbers, and on the broad version, strokes level, like, on the broad strokes level, it's easier just to go love, yeah, love, love. Yes, you know what love is. That's what I mean. That's what I mean. Like it's not that they couldn't; it's that they chose not to. Yeah, and I just don't agree. I think that he should have gone into the deeper end of the pool with this story because it is very much after school special level when it comes to that. But uh, but also, I did really appreciate the attention to detail within that, though. He, 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 JMS made sure to hit all of the correct beats and the story structure. He made sure that we got the themes and he made sure that they were coherent within the 80 minutes, even though I have some disagreements with it. These are also personal preferences. It, uh, I mean... This is in line with the B5 movies in which it just doesn't have that clear focus that I would prefer that we get, like that I would prefer that we do get in the 45-minute episodes. We've been all over the place, giving it praise, giving it harsh criticisms, but would you say you were happy with what you got? Being told, hey, there's going to be new Babylon 5 with the cast JMS is here to write it. It's an animated movie. The sky's the limit, but also you know that there's going to be certain things that are going to weigh it down as well. Were you happy with what you got? I'm going to play semantics Mm. and say that I'm not happy, but I'm satisfied. You? Yes. It's something that's going to still be processing in my brain after this discussion but yes this yes was you're happy something that made me happy with what it was doing and what we were given this could have been worse but it also could have been better yeah i i think that it just having a goal that it was doing and it succeeded in that was great it didn't have too many high ambitions. It didn't overreach. It brought back the actors that I know and love, and they all, well, not all, but a good portion of them got stuff to do or they had their moments. I would have loved more moments with them, but they they gave me a story that they promised, which is John Sheridan is going to learn more about himself, his relationship, and the meaning of the universe. And they did just that. The film did just that. I would have loved more Londo or more Vonover or heck, you, you know, even give me Jason Carter back as Marcus. There's, you know, but that's just me as a fanboy. But I also appreciate how much this did and didn't give us the fanboy crap because this is nostalgic. It does nostalgia bait you, does remember berries you at points, but uh, I don't think it was to a uh, to a lazy extent. This wasn't 
to a degree in which I would roll my eyes and say it's nothing but a clip show of your favorite moments. But yeah, I'm I'm overall happy with it. There were some things that were odd. We didn't talk about um the jokes that much. This is very uh jokey. Yeah, and there are some that are like, oh that's fun, and then there's some like No. No, thank you. I don't I I no. Stop doing this. I don't want this. I uh, you know, I I'm not gonna be a Grinch. I I, I enjoyed like seventy percent of the jokes. I, I got a good laugh out of when they would lean in with visual gags with the animation like Garibaldi grabbing out his PPG and the uh Sheridan giving him the hold off there. Uh, as clearly Delenn is coming through this portal. That was funny. But we have to just... <sighs> There's this one recurring gag that lasts for like two minutes and they and JMS shoved this recurring gag in like 15 times and then abandoned it, which was Zathras and Sheridan are talking about how he's lost in time and Sheridan's going to say, and space... And Zathras has this fourth wall break meta commentary thing where it's like, no, no, we can't say that because there's copyright issues because Lost in Space is a show that exists yeah. and they can't say it because of copyright yeah, or something. What? And then the scene proceeds with them trying to say that, and then he's like, "Yeah, and that you know that thing we can't mention because of legal reasons," and blah blah blah. And then literally they abandon it, and within the same scene, Zathras says "space," and I'm like, "You, you, well, you just, you just stop fucking doing it." And that there was the worst thing in the movie. I just, it wasn't funny, and no. it was not Babylon Five. No, and it didn't work. It has its wink, wink, nudge, nudge things to reality. Reality, hey, where this station means something. We're not some deep space franchise. Is a great line. Yeah, it, but it, but it makes sense. This here is like, wait, wait. Zathras knows about copyright, and we're not allowed in twenty two whatever. Uh, fucking, what was that? That was just. Oh, and Rachel, could you could you go over you 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 really got up in arms about this one? They're landing on Epsilon three. Lockley is talking to the self-defense grid in Epsilon 3, and we get some uh, uh, Phantom Menace-type humor here. I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to relive that. It was stupid. Stupid. And, it, it, like, her bumbling like that does not feel right. And just being like, please don't shoot us. Don't, don't shoot us till we can explain, and then don't shoot us after, please. And then the droids are talking to each other. The turrets are talking to each other. Yeah. Uh, but, but I know they what they are. But if, no, no, but if they were droids, just... it would make some fucking sense. No, but uh, I said droids because Star Wars. Yeah. This felt like Star Wars. This felt like Phantom Menace. This was Jar Jar Binks level shit. It, they were making silly noises. I couldn't tell if there was Zathrases inside the turrets talking to one another or if it was just the turrets. What the hell was that? What the hell was that? Well, how much can we criticize it when it washes the plate clean? Mm. Or, Or the metaphorical slate. No, no, I cleaned off the whole plate, if we can quote Anthony Anderson from Transformers. I cleaned off the whole plate. The ending. We, we've, we've circled around it, we've, we've briefly touched it, but let's, let's just go into some finer detail and what it's promising to us or what it could lead off into. So, Rachel, what goes on? John returns home, of course, he goes back to Delenn, so we must follow him back to Delenn and them embracing, and uh, maybe we, we we see President John Sheridan uh, fill, fulfill the arc he's been going through in the yeah. whole movie in a, uh, an epilogue-like fashion, right? Yeah. It doesn't just have him going off in the portal and then we don't see that one again, right? <laughs> oh, why are you laughing? 
Why are you laughing? It's not funny. Wait, did that happen? Ah, I see. I see. So what did happen, Rachel? Rachel, this isn't funny. JMS himself is listening and he needs to know your opinion as the only Australian Babylon 5 podcast. Um, we come in here with the facts of life. And he needs it. Why are you giggling? I hear him crossing his arms. Gritting his teeth. Grabbing his, uh, grabbing one of his hats to put on. Just so that he can throw it on the ground. Larry. Larry's not here to talk to, Rachel. Larry's not here to talk to. Larry Tatilio is no longer with us. And if he did write anything in this uh, feature film, he he would have he would have made sure to have uh, Walker Smith give a thumbs up yeah. in animated form. And I miss Walker Smith. Where was he? Oh. Watch your back. So what happened in the end? <laughs> in the end, we go to a different universe. Not one. Not our original B five timeline. Slightly different one, where there's this new Sheridan. And Dylan hasn't become half human. And all three commanders are there at once. Lockley is a fucking freak who is just arguing with Sinclair. That's a duo I never thought we would see talk to one another. And Sinclair's Mr. Why are you why are you like this? Why who broke you? <laughs> who broke you? Like, yeah. And you get to hear both actors pronounce the word hostile differently to one yeah. another. And I that's just a, yeah. that doesn't matter to anything. No. I just wanted to raise that. No. Now you know. <laughs> now you know. Go go watch that scene and hear them both pronounce hostile differently to one another. Just happen. That's all that's it. Oh, Lanier is uh best friends with Lita. Uh, and really thick, apparently. As in intelligence-wise, not booty-wise. And also, Lita hasn't been modified, potentially? Yeah, and she doesn't have the Psychor badge, so does Psychor exist in this universe? Because they say IPX doesn't exist in this universe. It went went dead ten years ago. So things are very different. Anna... No word of her. Maybe John never married Anna. Mm-hmm. Did he marry Lockley? She didn't seem to uh, infer anything there. She's like, hey, my ex-husband, John. Because <laughs> they would have been, you know, who knows? Different timeline. Different timeline. Did he kill the Black Star? We don't know. We don't Was know. there a Mimbari War? Who knows? It's a new universe. Londo and Jakar still hate each other. Yes. That much is true. Yes. Yes. And Garibaldi is still Londo's best friend in this timeline. Yep. Ah, Mr. We Garibaldi. Still we still got that. And uh, Dr. Franklin is also here. <laughs> he was the one that's like, oh, I guess uh, you're here Franklin. too. Hey, Franklin. Uh, okay. He's sassy. That's his okay. thing. Okay. And the weird hand. Yeah, the like. talk to the wrist. The hand's not listening. Oh, sure. Hey, Rachel, can I talk to your wrist, please? Oh, well, my one of my wrists will answer you back. No, 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 no. I, I have punctuation marks tattooed on my one of my wrists. So Rachel's so, going to full stop me right now? No, it's a semicolon and a question mark. So Is I it? Just go. See, I put a question mark at the end of that. Real hard for Rachel. She's She's wrapped... Yeah, but the whole I'm thing overjoyed. is overjoyed. Overjoyed, happy feelings all the time. It is a backdoor pilot. It is saying, "Hey, could we do more in this?" This. What about this, this one? What about this one? Ivanova is up in C and C, uh, and I didn't. Uh, <laughs> um, it's a way to do it. Yeah, it it does a thing. It does a thing, and it and it does it. It's a way we'll to do it. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. I guess you can, you know, if he wants to tell more stories in an animated universe, and or if there is a Babylon Five series, and this is the place we set it in. I guess it's what you need, but honestly. I would just be fine if New Babylon 5 was about new people. 
but we can't do that. We tried and it failed. And so go back and just do new versions of these characters and it will be all different. I had a, like the ending kind of left me with nothing. I just went, oh, okay. Would you want to watch more? I would watch it if it came along. Uh, like, I would see what's on offer, but I'm more reserved than I was going into this one. I've, you know, I've had this is a step up from the Lost Tales where that promised us that we could have more of that, and I said, and I said, and many people said, no, thank you. This is one where I say, sure, sure, if you've got something more to tell, go ahead. I'm not going to be patiently waiting for it. I'll just be doing other things and then, oh, here it is. Oh, cool. I'll watch it. And that kind of says our rating in a weird way of the thing. I know we've got a a, a spotlight section, but uh, if you had to rate The Road Home on our scale of yum being bad and yum yum being good, what would you give it? I refuse to do it until we've done the spotlight because that is... Order. Well, Rachel, since you're so excited about doing the spotlight, the part of the show where we talk about an actor or actress that appeared in the thing that we have watched, we talk about what they did here, if we like their performance, any other pieces of trivia, and or if we've seen them or heard them in other things. So and who are we doing? Right? Oh, I thought you knew. You were so keen oh, on no, getting I here. No, I want to hear it from you. Oh, I want to hear it from you. You want to hear it from my yes. holy mouth? Oh, well, here I, we I do. Well, I do. I cannot wait to hear your lusset tones. I thought it was good to talk about the man who played Zathras slash Sinclair. He is Paul Guyet, uh, G-U-Y-E-T. I hope that's how you pronounce his last name. Uh, We could have talked about Phil Lamar, but everyone kind of knows Phil Lamar if you know voice acting. But this man here had uh, arguably one of the toughest jobs to play Zathras. Zathras is a, a meme character, honestly. We all love making jokes about Zathras and how there's multiple Zathrases, and here we get them called Zathrai. And he had a very tough thing to do because that performance is super specific. We all do our impressions of Zathras. His Sinclair is honestly piss poor. Um, (laughs) I've moved to just saying it's not very good. It's just generic man voice. But his Zathras are very, very well done. We've already praised it throughout the stuff, but was there a a moment for you that you felt at ease with this version of Zathras, this portrayal of it? Because it didn't immediately click into place for me, but there was a point where I realized, oh, I'm on board. I like this. I didn't have a specific moment that... Like, it turned for me. I felt more gradual, like I just got into it. Did you have a a favourite Zathras moment or scene or gag or even line delivery from Um, this guy? I like the explanation of the great machine cloning them. That uh, particular conversation just tickled my fancy. I really got a kick out of, and this is when he cemented himself as doing a fantastic job, was that long pause after Lockley said a really embarrassing thing, and he just said, you know you brought her, right? Like, he had that little back and forth of, she came with you, you you know that, yeah? Yeah, and he's like, I needed a lift, I needed a ride, whatever it is. It had that snarkiness that I appreciate from this character, whilst also bringing it into the modern age a little bit more. There was uh, uh, just something about Zathras chiding Sheridan about bringing a freak with him when Zathras is a freak. And I also also really loved him talking about there's a universe where I'm considered handsome. 
The stars are dimly lit, but yeah, you know, like, it's still it's still impressive. Like there's not much light in the universe, but, so, but there, still it, it exists. It's, it's still, there. It's there. You can't take it away from me now. Still exists, and yeah, this actor. I you know I am looking over his IMDb, and he's been in this for a while now, since like 2005, and he does voice work primarily. He does a lot, a lot of, of voice games. work, a lot of video games. He did a lot of. Random stuff here and there. You have your Elder Scrolls. You have your Red Dead Redemption. You have a lot of anime stuff or cartoons like Transformers and Lupin the Third and Dragon Quest and Mo- Mo- Mobile Suit Gundam. And so I will praise to bits that Babylon 5 is back, baby, because with an actor like this, we really are home because... That series had nothing but a ton of random video game and anime voiceover dub people. And so we're here today. And this cast is filled to the brim with anime and voiceover dub people. And thank you so much, Warner Brothers, for allowing a sci-fi classic to stand on its feet again and have all of these random anime people and these random video game actors. And this guy, he's on Twitter or X or social media, and he has been very much a vocal presence in the promotion for this movie. I've seen him on many posts. He interacts. I could at him right now and he'll probably reply. He seems like a really cool dude. He is... Super happy to be a part of this production. His energy is infectious, both uh, in the performance and from what I see of his presence online when it comes to being in Babylon 5. And and I think that's why he stands out as a great performance out of this new cast of people is he has he just has enthusiasm for the role. While say, we didn't even talk about Garibaldi. The guy who does his voice. I kept forgetting, oh, oh, that's Garibaldi talking to me right now. I'd have to look at the design and be like, oh, that's Garibaldi. But when I would blink or turn my head and hear that voice, I didn't think it was Garibaldi at all. I, I didn't really register. But but this man here, he's, Sinclair isn't good, but his Zathras is just full of life. How long will this take? Ten minutes. This is why we call it Great Machine, not So-So Machine. Uh, Zathras make coffee while Zathras wait for Zathras. Now, Rachel, are you ready to rate The Road Home on our immaculate scale? It, you can't dispute how good this scale is of yum being bad and yum yum being good. No half yums. I am ready, but I think you should do the honors first. No, you delayed us. Uh, I had a perfect uh, just flow and segue before, and you said, no, 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 Ryan, we've got to follow the structure of Spotlight first and then the rating. So I'm on the edge of my seat to hear (laughs) your expert opinion as the Australian Babylon 5 podcasting host. What is your rating? You are also that. You are just as much the... Australia Babylon 5 podcast host, as I am, if anything more. But people listen to this podcast for you. They listen for me to make sure they hear me make you laugh. (laughs) We've had several comments of that over the years of, I really like it when Ryan makes Rachel laugh. That's my contribution. (laughs) Making me laugh. Okay. You got, it's got to be you, honey. Rachel's be nervous you. because she's going to give this a yum. That's the prediction. I am going to be a brave man. And brave man. Go, that, go, 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 go. Well, if you let me. Uh, geez, stepping on my toes here, Rachel. Uh, I am going to give it a yum, yum. Yum, yum. I liked it. Uh, I have all of these things that I have critiqued it for and maybe makes it sound like I didn't like it, but my 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 overall reaction to it is a pleasant smile and just a, a, a Walker Smith thumbs, thumbs up. up. And I just, I had a good time. I pointed at the screen and said, hey, it's that thing. Hey, look, they got the defense grid out on Babylon 5. Hey, yeah. I, I had my thrills. I had my chills, but it worked its magic on me. 
well enough. This isn't outstanding. This is probably one of the better Babylon 5 movies, but it isn't as good Mm -hmm. as a Babylon 5 episode. Like I said, I am satisfied, but not happy with this. But on the whole, I cannot say that it's bad. It. I wanted this to be a more wholehearted yum yum, but it's still a yum yum for me. Yum yum. That is all we have for you on this podcast. We just needed to rush in and watch this movie, talk about it, and try and get this discussion out as uh, quickly as possible. We'll be going back to our regularly scheduled program of Season 5 coverage of B5, so make sure to tune in for the next episode, as well as we are covering uh, Space Above and Beyond. We did that for our Patreon first, and each episode out is now coming out one at a time, so if that is of your fancy, make sure to listen to that. You can find us on your social media of choice under Yum Yum Pod or Yum Yum Podcast. If you want to email us, you can do that if you type in the little two box yumyumpod at gmail.com. We, as stated, have a Patreon, so if you like what we do here and you want to throw a couple of dollary dues, as we call them down here, uh, our way, you can do so over at Patreon, uh, Yum Yum Podcast. We have so much extra bonus content. We are going through The Expanse right now, as well as the Robocop movie franchise. We have a group Discord that you can be a part of, but... All of that is in the description below, and you should share this episode about the place, send it to your friends, your family, your foes. But until next time, Rachel, Jakar... Was here, was serving up some yum-yum energy, in my opinion, but he did not, he did not give us the callback that we really deserved. Yes. Which was he did not thump his chest. Did not thump a chest. And depart by saying, Good eating to you. Good eating to you. Ah, Mr. Cannibal, dear.